Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante. I'm with Wikibon.org, and my co-host Jeff Kelly is here with me. We're here all day at the MIT Information Quality Symposium. This is the Cube. We go to the events. We extract the signal from the noise. We bring you the smartest people at these events and share with you their knowledge. Mario Faria is here. He is a member of the MIT Data Science Initiative. Um, he is part of a big data technology advisor. Uh, to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and an individual that is knows a lot about CDOs, chief data officers. He was the first chief data officer in Latin America, and uh, has recently moved to the United States. Well, welcome to the Cube, and welcome to America. Thank you. <laughs> so glad to be here, Dave. Yeah, Thank it's great to see you. So, so you were here yesterday as well, Mario, uh, talking to the the chief data officers. I think you did a talk on unstructured data, and I want to I want to talk about that, but. I want to go back to uh, your role as the chief data officer at Boa Vista, which was part of Equifax. In the, the first one in Latin America, we heard from Stuart Madnick today that uh, the, the guys at MIT Sloan did some research. They said the first CDO they could ever find was like 2003. I'm sure they were, existed before that, it had a different name, but how did it come about that you became the first chief data officer in It's, it's also funny, Professor Richard Wong, which is part of the Stuart Madnick uh, team, he went to Brazil uh, three years ago, he had a meeting with the member of the Boa Vista, and he asked them, why don't you have a CDO in place here? You guys need a CDO because your business is data related. Yeah, sure. So uh, the CEO uh, uh, for the company, uh, he reached me out. I have an experience with uh, digital marketing, with supply chain, CRM, and I'm not a data guy per se, but I'm more on the downstream of data process. I understand on how to make uh, use and monetize in terms of data. You're so a data practitioner in a that's sense. That's correct, yeah. yeah, that's correct. Well, that's, so that's interesting, because you know, uh, in the early days of, of CIO, even before the CIO term came about, the leader of technology tended to be somebody who was very technical, increasingly they're more business people. So it sounds like the CDO is taking a similar path. Is that right? That's right, that's right. Even though I have a background in computer science, through my whole life I've been working on very uh, specific technology uh, projects related to business benefits. Like in a sense that to streamline some operations for uh, retailers, in a sense of uh, increasing uh, customer loyalty for some uh, global brands throughout the world. And that's why I got involved with this data. Well, so, so, so <laughs> the notion of a CDO, so your CEO essentially made the decision after talking to, to Richard, he kind of got the idea, uh, but, but, and I'm sure he had a good gut feel about it as well. Was there any other you know, justification process? I mean, we heard earlier this morning from uh, our keynote speaker, Dat, that this is not a project. This is a, it's a journey, it's an ongoing thing. So how do you justify, how do organizations justify the role of a CDO? How do they make a business case around it? Do they, do they have to or is it just such so blatantly obvious that they need one? Uh, I, we had this question yesterday and my point is, when you bring a CFO, do you make a business case to bring your CFO or do you make a business case to bring your CIO in place? So it's a matter of uh, common sense for every company nowadays, data has been a critical asset to bring value. In a sense that you have to manage your data, you have to have a good strategy on how and where to buy data from your partners, and how you combine this data to create information that's valuable for your customers that you are trying to serve. So was it your responsibility to do, so what did you do when your first day on the job? What did you, what did you say? Do I have to start with figuring out how to build a data architecture? Do I figure what I have? Yeah. Or what, do you, what did you do? First day on the job, uh, I spent the majority of the time talking to my peers, mm -hmm. understanding their expectations, trying to understand how they feel about data, to understand what qua data quality problems the company had that were hurting sales, that were hurting product development, I, my, I would say that my first 100 days on the job, I did more listening than to do any action, mm -hmm. okay? So I tried to understand all the issues, and together with my team, we created this uh, vision that what we need to do to implement in the years to come. So you, you were like a CEO taking over a new job, like Meg Whitman. I said, Meg, what'd you do on the first day? Of the job? First day and first 100 days, all I did is see customers. You <laughs> saw your customers, you sought them out. That's correct, because in, in, in a, in a, in a, you have two approaches of being a successful CDO. <laughs> you can be a tactical one, 
in a sense that you can look at the data, data management, and, and everything, or you can have a more strategic approach. Mm -hmm. And when the CEO, he came to me, invited me for the position, he told me, Mario, I want data to be looked as a strategic asset for your business. And I want you to be as much strategic as you can, as you can to help our, our business to move forward. Mm. Okay, so in a sense, I, 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 yeah. I would like uh, running a business on my right. own. Yeah. So really, it sounds like the key uh, to getting started is focus on the business problem and the business issues and maybe the business opportunities rather than <laughs> the data, which maybe is not is a little counterintuitive to, to the role of a chief data officer. Is that, would that be accurate? Yeah, it's, it's very accurate because in, 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 in let's going back to the, to the return on investment uh, question that Dave has just asked, asked. You're there to try to, to, to bring it, to make a difference. You're there to make money or to save costs in a, in an area that you're uh, you, uh, having some inefficiency. So in, in that sense, what I did and what my team did uh, with me, the team that I led, we're looking at issues that we had to solve. Mm -hmm. From the day one, I told my, my organization, we are gonna be working onward, out, outward in a sense. We're gonna be working for the sales organization, for the products organization for the uh, people who are there in front of the customers. We're gonna be helping them. We are gonna be a service provider organization for them to succeed. Mm -hmm. So uh, talk a little bit about the organizational structure. Uh, so w where does the CDO really sit in the, in the organizational structure and how do you, and your team, how do, how do you um, help, in, help your team engage with the business? Uh, do, you, do you have team members sitting in business units or how do you actually structure, a, uh, how does, where does the CDO sit and, and how do you structure your team throughout the enterprise? Okay, in, in our case, data was so important that this chief data officer position was reporting to the CEO directly. Wow. So okay. the CIO was my peer, the leader of sales, the leader of marketing, the, the leader of products, they were all my, my peers. We were we're I was reporting directly to the CIO. De depending on the company, you see some CDOs reporting to, to the COO. Depending on the company, you see them reporting to the people at marketing. What I don't think it, it, it's uh, the best move is for the CDO to report to the CIO. I don't okay. buy that because data should be seen as a business issue, not as a technical issue. And in the sense on my organization, I have created uh, several areas and, and I divided my team in people that are responsible for data acquisitions, people are responsible for the data operations that were bringing the data that were coming in and make sure that all the process was streamlined until the, the, the data was combined to give information. I had people with uh, responsible for data quality. I had people responsible for performance improvement, people with Six Sigma and Lean backgrounds that were looking uh, through the whole process and not, not just from the data per se, but all the functions involved with that. And I also had the data architecture organization that were responsible for helping IT work together with the product team to define new solutions. So mm -hmm. it was a very, uh, at one time our organization had 120 people, which was, uh, from what I have seen here on the research on the uh, MIT, was one of the largest data organizations in the world. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we're here at the uh, Information Quality Symposium. So talk a little bit about the, uh, the concept of data quality, information quality, in this kind of, in this big data world. Um, you've been in this business a while. H how has the concept of big, of, sorry, of data quality evolved as we're starting to talk about uh, quote unquote big data, new data sources coming from often outside the enterprise, uh, whether it's social media data or you know uh, could be machine generated data, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. How has data quality, the, the concept, evolved, and and what does it look like today in a big data world? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have a, s a saying uh, with data people say, if garbage in, garbage out. So if if you don't have data process quality in every step where your data is being uh, processed in your organization, you will have a problem and you'll be hurting yourself uh, down the line. So. The term data quality, I think it should evolve as being part of what we call this framework of data science. Mm -hmm. Data science in, in per se is how you can look at raw data and make the, that data bring value to you, to your organization, uh, to your business. So in a sense, quality for me is one of the pillars for the data science framework. Mm -hmm. So that's really part of what the job of a data scientist is to um, apply those data quality measures, it sounds like. That's correct, that's mm -hmm. correct. And, 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 and I had the lucky to, to have a very uh, competent team in place in my organization, people with Six Sigma 
background mm -hmm. that help a lot to create those metrics. Mm -hmm. So for any organization that wants to succeed, try to look at the Toyota production system, try to look at the lean methodologies, try to look at Six Sigma that was uh, became very popular because of uh, General Electric, GE. So look at uh, those things outside of the data area because they really apply for the data concepts that we're trying to Right, so data scientists is more than just knowing statistics, it's knowing some of these business concepts and Six Sigma and the lean uh, model, if you will. Yeah. So, Mario, you talked yesterday to the, the, to the uh, CDO uh, gathering uh, 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 unstructured data was your topic. We had Stuart Madnick on before. He gave us a three-dimensional model, and one of the one of the dimensions he might have talked to you about this was uh, the kind of data, the traditional data, you know, sales data, inventory data versus what he called nouveau data, Twitter, which is essentially unstructured. Mm -hmm. um, and some people don't like that term. I'm comfortable with the term unstructured or semi-structured, whatever you want to call it. What was the discussion like? What were you talking to the CDOs about, and what was the feedback? Uh, we we had there people from a uh, financial service organization, people from healthcare. And uh, basically, we're trying to look where unstructured data makes sense and how do you go to do projects and how you can you succeed on that. And specifically, when you see a world as of today and that the U.S. government is building near Utah a $2.5 billion facility to monitor what's happening in terms of communication, social media, and everything, they have a, 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 a very large unstructured data problem. And the point that I brought yesterday, we should bring those guys here next year so they can teach us what they are doing, how they are creating the metadata, how they're using a dic dictionary, what data quality issues they are dealing with uh, every day. Should not bring them here to discuss if th they're doing is right or wrong. Forget about that, but let, let's talk on the te technicalities that they are doing, methodologies they are applying for, for that. And yesterday, we're able to, to figure out that not everybody is using their internal data that they have inside the organization. So if you want to go there and get information from social media, from what the media is telling about your company, your brand, or you get a brand sentiment that will interfere in your marketing campaign, <laughs> you should also look at the internal data that you've been generating for emails that have been sent, for your contracts that probably are, are, are not in place at this point. So you have a lot of internal data that probably is not being used at this point. So thinking about sort of the traditional you know, issues around data quality in the, in the world of you know, what some people again call structured, and think about thinking about your role at, uh, at Boa Vista, uh, thing, you know, a part of a company that does you know, credit reporting. So obviously there's, it's you know, very important to have data quality there. Um, and then compare that to Twitter data, where a false positive, you know, no big deal. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, on the one hand, you've got you know, things like financial services and healthcare, which is critical, and then you've got this influx of new data. How do you see the, the, the change in the structure of the data affecting the data quality imperative? Mm -hmm. Yeah, depending on the business that you go, granularity plays a large role. And in our case, uh, it was very granular. We had to go to the quality <coughs> down to every detail for a customer or for mm. a company, in, 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 in like an address, phone, or uh, uh, credit history, purchase history that uh, a company or individual might have in the past. So we have to be really, really careful. And when we apply data quality methodologies, we had to be even more paranoid on dealing with that because any error could hurt our business tremendously. So quality was played a, a really, really strong issue on, on every day for our business. Well, so can you take that, so you know, take the credit score, you know? Okay, great, I got you know, 780, I'm good. Or, mm -hmm. you know, this is well below that, I'm bad. Mm -hmm. Could you apply that, uh, even in a traditional business, you know, like credit scoring, uh, to social media? I Maybe mean, come up with some kind of you know, social media, social graph, uh, you know, propensity to swear in public on social you know, data. And, you know, uh, do you see that, or are those two separate worlds? It sounds like the latter. No, uh, 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 you're absolutely right. Pick a company like Cloud. What they yeah, do, yeah, you, sure. you have uh, your social media score. Yeah, yeah. In a sense, what they're doing is that uh, saying uh, how many tweets are retweeting, or how many posts on your Facebook people are liking. In a sense, Cloud is a social media credit score company. Yeah, yeah sure. So uh, I bet that the founder of Cloud they looked, he looked at, at, at this, uh, the, the credit bureau industry for that. Mm. And 
we, the credit in industry bureaus, we have to look outside to do our, our jobs for better. And what I did as a CDO there, I implemented concepts that I took from manufacturing companies. What I told you about the Toyota production system, Six Sigma from GE, and also the Lean methodology, those are companies that were applied first for manufacturing companies. Mm. And I used them to manage digital assets. Now, you're also chairing a session on uh, uh, new trends and directions in, in data science. What are some of the things that you hope to, to learn at that session? Well, I, I hope to learn a lot because yeah. I'm bringing uh, two individuals uh, 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 that, that are the top-notch guys uh, from what I have done my, my conversations recently for the last few months. I was very impressed w w with Matt, with Andrew, and I brought them here to this conference for them to share what they see as the future that when we go beyond Hadoop and AppReduce. Hadoop and AppReduce are great technologies, but they, are, they do not solve some of the problems that we are uh, They create uh, a lot of problems. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and what I'm going to be talking is uh, how artificial intelligence makes sense for you to implement a high-end data quality initiative and where we're going beyond Hadoop and AppReduce. And those are, 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 are the discussions that we're going to be having in, in that So panel. you're saying using analytics, algorithms, you know, machines to improve data quality, and then the, the, the obvious follow-on question there is, you know, the the bromide and big data is you can't take humans, you know, out of the equation. Humans are the last mile. So um, do you buy that, you know, or can can machines do most of it in terms from a data quality standpoint? Machines can automate, but we're never going to be able to take the human side of that. Okay, and uh, a lot of tasks that I do as of today that my team does and all the data professionals th that they have to do are, are, are still not very automated. So there's a lot of things that we can au automate, make, make their jobs more brain oriented and not, not, not as like a labor oriented. So that, because yeah, so, so that, currently it doesn't scale well. That's correct. Uh, it's way too expensive to scale. So in your vision, to the extent that you can automate, let's say, you know, whatever, 80%, 90% of those tasks, are you then at the point where you can scale much more seamless, seamlessly. We can scale and we'll be able to look at new data sources. We'll be able to create new solutions that we that are not here in this market as well. For example, uh, I, uh, when I joined Boa Vista and I understood what a credit bureau company does, we're not just about credit bureau, we're about human behavior. We have information about human beings and how do they interact with each other. So when you go to a store and, and, and buy a cell phone, for example, and, and the cell operator checks your credit history, he's looking at a lot of things that happen in your past life that is part of your human behavior. So credit, beh uh, credit uh, score companies have to look at that, have to look at not new sources of information that can improve or can lower your credit score throughout your life. Yeah, so you're talking about new sources of business value being created. How do you think that'll change the spending profile? I mean, because let's face it, this, uh, this entire industry has been under huge budget pressures for you know, at least a decade. Uh, oh, geez, I got to spend more on my data warehouse, and it's, mm -hmm. it, it takes me forever to get you know, another channel into my system. Mm -hmm. Do you think what you're describing will change the spending profile and the investment profile? I think it, it will change a lot. And, and let me tell you from my personal experience. I moved here to the United States in December. I couldn't buy a car here because I didn't have any credit <laughs> for the United States. Even though I had, I carry uh, 15 years right, of so good credit history. You're in a Brazil. great customer. You're a perfect prospect, <laughs> but you can't buy a car. I can't buy a car <laughs> here. Can you believe that? So <laughs> it, it, it took me a while until I could get a car because the credit score companies here in the United States, they were not using information from other countries. Mm -hmm. So in, a, in, a, in, 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 in some sense, there are a lot of inefficiencies. In our industry, that's very big data oriented. Mm -hmm. So if you look at other industries, you see those kind of inefficiencies, and that's how the CDO plays a large part of that. Awesome. So uh, we're, we're get, getting close on time, but I wonder if you could give uh, you know one piece of advice to other maybe CDOs out there that are just kind of getting started in their job, and um, wh what piece of advice would, would you give them to, to be successful in their careers? Um, you know, not necessarily a, a technology related, but uh, you know, career advice for a CDO. What does it take? What, what's a, a good piece of advice in terms of surviving out there mm -hmm. uh, in this n relatively new role um, that may be looked on with a little bit of suspicion from other parts of the organization? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, not every data person will be a CDO down the road. In a sense that not every soldier will be a general mm -hmm. down the road. 
So a lot of skills are needed if you want to be a CDO. You have to be good at communication, have to be good at data, have to be good at statistics and mathematics, have to be good at dealing with people, and have to be a great understanding of technology as well. So you have to be a more complete profile to succeed. So it's really a, a blend of skills, it sounds like. That's right. That's fantastic. Well, Mario, thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. We uh, appreciate uh, having you. Uh, great conversation. We hope you'll join us again next time our paths cross. Yeah, uh, excellent. So, yeah, and good luck with the, the panel and, uh, and, and uh, the pleasure meeting you. So we'll see you, you soon. Thanks All right, so keep much. right there, everybody. This is Dave Vellante with Jeff Kelly. This is theCUBE. We're right back with our next guest right after this.